Coming up in this edition of the TV Black Box, The Block facing production issues, Ricky Gervais facing a backlash over his Netflix special, and the Australian pretty much declares TV is dead. But is it? Welcome to the podcast where people in the TV industry get their news. This is TV Black Box, the podcast. This is TV Black Box, bringing you the inside goss from the TV industry. G'day there, I'm Rob McKnight. I'll introduce the panel in just a moment. But first, it was during this week in television history that we saw the premiere of this game show. Temptation, a remake of the classic Sale of the Century, went to air in 2005 on the Nine Network. Hosted by Ed Phillips and Lavinia Nixon, it ran for four seasons with over 500 episodes in the can. All right, let's meet the panel now. Please welcome TV Black Box contributor Aaron Ryan. Hello, Aaron. Hello, gorgeous people. The viewer's advocate, Mulk. Hello, Mulk. A pale comparison, Robert McKnight. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> actress extraordinaire Sarah Monaghan. Hello, Sarah. Hello. And David Robinson, the television presenter's presenter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who writes this shit? Indeed I am. Um, I like that. I've got to ask you about Temptation. I barely remember it. It is a wonderful show. It was a remake of Sale of the Century. Now, Temptation was the original name back in, I think, the 50s and yes. the 60s, where it yes. first started. Uh, when they brought it back in 2005, it was to revamp the, the Nine Network schedule at 7 o'clock. It didn't work so well. It did run for 500 episodes, uh, but they quickly got rid of it after Ed Phillips, his contract was up. They uh, blasted him off, and then they ran the remaining episodes. I have been on a boat with Ed Phillips and Lavinia Nixon. It was uh, thanks to one Mark Beretta. Hello, Barretts. I know he listens. He's a a long-time listener. Uh, And we went on a boat trip um, around Sydney Harbour. And Ed Phillips came on board just dressed in your um in your dts uh and oh, he was he was filling those medals. out yeah filling those out very well uh it was uh <laughs> the gift shop was up and running um and lavinia lavinia nixon was lovely as well but they were both wonderful people but uh, you don't you don't prepare yourself to see a game show host in his dts but uh he was wonderful You're for so it's acceptable. It's better yeah, than no being one, maybe not in but, your day, Robert. No, but no one else was in their DTs, Sarah. That, this is the thing. <laughs> Everyone else was. Yeah, did he own the right. yacht? He did not at all. We picked oh. him up um, from another from another spot there. He didn't, and I love the man for his confidence. So a big hello to him. A pale comparison. And a big hello to Lavinia Nixon, who I love, love, love. She is a beautiful person. And speaking of beautiful people, we begin this podcast following on from that devastating news last week on the sudden death of Erin Jane. The former Aerobics Oz style and Studio 10 host died last week at the age of just 42, and it's now been confirmed as a suicide. Many friends have come out and said they wish they'd done more to help her and her struggles with mental health issues. The very talented and versatile presenter leaves behind three children and her husband. Now, we don't often talk about suicide and and mental health, but I actually thought this was worthy of acknowledging because Erin Jane, who I worked with at the morning show in Studio 10, and, and I don't claim for one moment that I knew her well. We worked together. We you know, we we basically did some stuff together, but I, I didn't know her that well. But she always struck me as a really down-to-earth person. And, Robbo, we just see mental health is a massive issue within the TV industry. Do you think more can be done to help people or is it just the dog-eat-dog world of television? It's a dog-eat-dog world, Rob, that's that's for sure. The thing is with mental health in television, um, if you're not at the top of your game uh, and just uh, bulletproof, then you're considered to be less than. And and that is, I, I really believe that. Um, if if you show any kind of um, softening or any kind of, um, you know, dent in your armour, that becomes a problem. Um, you need to be in television, especially in Australian television. You need to be strong. You need to be bulletproof. Nothing can get you. Nothing can harm you. And if it does, you're weak as piss. And what are you doing here? There are plenty of other people who want to be here instead of you. Um there is a wonderful thing throughout television where it's 
they're starting to come around and saying, oh, well, you know, if there are mental health issues, you've got to talk to us, you've got to communicate with us. It's it's all rubbish. It's all bullshit. Um, if, what if do you, you mean? Do you mean ha- from the networks or the production yeah, companies 100%. that run reality TV no, shows? No, 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 no. I'm talking about network. I, I don't have any problems or any, um, any experience with reality mm. shows, but I'm talking about networks and I'm saying that um, overall they can be good about it um, but at the end of the day, if you say to someone who's in management, and this has been my experience, uh, if you say to them, look, I'm not coping, it's not going well for me, um, well, then you're weakest person, you need to move on. Yeah. Um, that, that is a big thing. Uh, so we love to talk the talk. We love to walk the walk. Um, but when it actually comes to someone saying to you, I need help, I need support, uh, Australian TV is not the place for you. Is that, Robbo, and, and I'm asking you know, your experience and, and opinion, in part because of, you know, television is still, or at least a number of people who work in television, still think of it as the last bastion of, you know, the bright lights and the things, and and you know, it's a, it's a it's always been a boys' club at the top of the tree in the boardrooms, and mm. you know, if you don't join the parties, if you don't engage in all of the stuff, that that you know, you're seen as weaker or you're seen as lesser. So therefore, even if you want to show the vulnerability that you're that you've got mental health concerns or issues, that that only is compounded, independent of all of the nice, bright, shiny, but our shareholders need to know we're caring for our staff, that there's still mm. this underlying sort of premise that television is different when actually oh. it's not. No, it's it's not, and I love television. I really do. Um, in in the game, if you can make money off it, if you can um, make ratings off it, then fine. Tickety boo, television will um, will embrace you and say, "Let's talk about your story and let's and yep. let's broadcast that." If that isn't the case, then no, you're on the scrap heap, and that's really important. I remember Peter Peter Meekin once saying about Adam Boland um, when he was talking about his Australian story. He said that. Um, everyone in television has something wrong with them. Every everyone in television has some kind of mental deficiency. That is absolutely right. It, it, if you think about television, you you look at it as being why does this one industry uh, attract so many issues? And it's because people who want to work in TV are not sane. And I mean that in a really nice way. I mean that that everyone's got some issues, and that's the problem. So when you've got an industry that attracts everyone. That is, that is not always 100% mentally healthy, that's what you get. Um, and I think that we're still having problems within the industry of going, okay, well, we're attracting these people. How do we help these people? Um, but at the moment, and I think it's still the case, if, you are, if, if you're not bulletproof, if you cannot pretend like you can handle it, then eventually you'll be struck out. And, and, and that's the issue. And the thing is, Malk, it's not just about partying. That, I think that was once upon a time a thing. But it is an industry that's based on who's in and who's your mate. Not and, and I don't even mean that just from a bloke thing. This isn't a male-female thing because I think it happens on all levels of power. It's who you get on with. And I have seen so many yep. people promoted because they got on with someone and not because of the ratings return they had delivered. People can fail upwards in this industry. And this is the, one of the big problems. And we're going to talk about the future of TV in a moment in one of our topics. But the thing I would say to you is that there are so many occasions where people don't deliver ratings performance or good ratings performances mm. for shows and their shows are widely panned. They'll get another gig EPing a show. They'll get another gig being in charge of a show and get another turn and another turn and another turn. And it doesn't seem to be based on what you can deliver, but how well you get on with the people in charge. Who you have drinks with on Sunday. And that leads to problems. Erin Jane... I think, would be shocked at the amount of coverage she got when she would have doubted herself. She would have been so low that maybe she felt her career hadn't gone where she wanted it to go and maybe that played with her. But the simple fact is, look at the reaction it's got. And as I mentioned the other week, it's been one of the biggest stories on the various news websites. Yeah. Can, can I can I just say something really quickly on that? Uh, you're exactly right, Rob. Um, when you do a good job in TV, for the most part, you don't get told it, really, if, if you're at a certain level. If you're at the top level, then, yes, you were told, and that, that's part of the that's part of the gig. If you're on a, a separate level to the which Aaron James, and, and I, I'm only prophesizing here, but 
you don't get told that you're doing a great job. You ju- you just turn up, you do it, and it's. And if you do a bad job, if you if there is something wrong, you get wrong, told you, when you get it wrong. You absolutely get told when you get it wrong. Um, this breaks my heart that this woman was 42. She's got three kids, a husband. On the, on the surface, she looks like it's you know everything is wonderful and, and, and amazing. This is the reality of it. She had dreams. I'm assuming um, she had ambitions. Um, whether she felt in herself that she didn't get to it. You know, that's for her and we'll never know. Um, She was very talented. She did do a great job. She was wonderful at what she did. But in TV, if you do a shit job, you get told about it no matter what. If you do a good job, it's always rare. Yeah, that's right. It's rare that you get told. You're losing your job. You know, no matter what ratings you deliver, if you're not part of that in crowd, as I mentioned, 100%. You know, and. Look, for anyone listening to this, because there are a lot of people in the industry, if this topic has brought up issues for you, go to Lifeline, go to beyondblue.com.au. There are people out there who can help. Let's move on. Because while we might be used to complaints out of shows like Married at First Sight or My Kitchen Rules, who knew the block would find itself in controversy? Producers behind the show have denied recent claims that contestants were being denied basics such as food, toilet paper and car keys. An insider source has told the Daily Telegraph that the teams on the new season were doing it tough and that some days a muesli bar and apple is as good as it gets. But executive producer of the reality series Julian Crest told TV Tonight that that was all a lie and that host Scott Kem actually cooks a meal for the contestants at least two nights a week. While he acknowledged that filming the show is tough, he insisted all basics were provided. Aaron, I just can't believe this story. I've seen a lot of things in TV. And, and look, here's the thing. When you film something like Married at First Sight, you're having a dinner party, you might let the alcohol go free, flow free before you feed people because you want drama. It's different on the block. You certainly want drama. But they get paid at least per diems and and meal allowances every day they're being there. This idea that they're surviving on a muesli bar, I actually just don't cop. I think it's a smokescreen. I think there is absolutely a story here, but it's got nothing to do with what we've read. Um, In terms of food, you know, from what I understand, reading that story and a contact that I have there, um, I mean, Scott Cam even puts on on his own barbecue twice a week. I mean, as the story says, they get $1,400 a week uh, for the couples to spend on whatever they want. They're sponsored by LD. They can go down the road. They can get food. But I think there's actually a couple or maybe more than one couple that are really pissed off about something um, to do with production, which has nothing to do with this, um, and are using this as a bit of a smoke screen to put put crap out about the block. So so it's not going well for them. Or someone that supports them is leaking information that may not be quite right. Yeah, someone's pissed off about something. Um, and want to put some dirt out there, and but yeah, and there's no truth in it, like a you know eating a muesli bar and stuff. It's all rubbish. But I, I, I guarantee there's another story in there, and I'm trying to I'm trying to get to the bottom of that. Well, you keep digging, mate. You keep digging. Aaron's right, Rob. Um, something's rotten in the state of Denmark, and it's not that they're not being fed. Uh, I have it on good authority that uh, you know, they always have food sponsors they've got opportunity mm. to access food to access cars to be able to go nick down to the local sponsor to buy takeaway coffees or food or whatever they need to get the the scenario at play here is twofold someone has an axe to grind clearly they feel they are are being um disadvantaged in some way uh within the production and just remind me again um who owns the daily telegraph News Corporation. <laughs> News Corp, right. And who owns the channel that the block is broadcast on? Channel 9, which also owns Fairfax, <laughs> and the Sid- which owns the Sydney Morning Herald on the age. Right. So this, I mean, breaking news, um, opponents do things that we don't like very much. Maybe, but if you got a tip off that this was happening on the block, you would follow that story. Sure, but you'd also blow it absolutely out of the water up if you if it was like, this is not actually a story, but here's a chance for us to dig the knife in. Mm, maybe. All right, when it comes to the comedy of Ricky Gervais, there's nothing controversial about it. Well, that's according to the man himself. He knew there would be blowback from some of the jokes in his new Netflix special, but he says it's all relative. The comedy superstar says every single line someone is going to complain, either because they hate it 
or they don't get it. I can list 20 taboo subjects. Everyone in the world laughs at 19 of them and hates the one that affects them. Have a listen to what he said. Welcome to my show. Uh, it's not a show. There's no dancers or jugglers. It's basically a bloke talking, um, which is essentially what stand-up comedy is, isn't it? A bloke talking. Sexist. Um, <laughs> what about all the funny female comedians? Like, um... <laughs> no, no, no. Right. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. OK, right. That was irony, OK? There's going to be a bit of that throughout the show. See if you can spot it, OK? <laughs> now, that's when I say something I don't really mean for comic effect. And you as an audience, you laugh at the wrong thing because you know what the right thing is. It's a way of satirising attitudes. Like that first joke, I use the old-fashioned sexist trope that women aren't funny. Now, in real life, I know there are loads of funny women. Like, um... <laughs> <laughs> I did it again. Well spotted. Good. <laughs> Love it. Many critics have come out and said he should effectively be cancelled and his content removed from Netflix. Sarah, there was a lot of bro- blowback to his um, transgender jokes that were throughout the show. Do you think it's worthwhile of being cancelled? No, look, he said before he made this special that he wanted to make something that would offend absolutely everybody. And it was after the Chappelle thing. And I think he purposely did it because of the Chappelle thing. But here's the thing. He says he's being inclusive because it's true. If you pick one certain set of people that you will not include in jokes, then you are being discriminatory because everybody deserves to have the piss taken out. <laughs> and that's what people need to realise. Is it's Well, he not- made that point. And, and look, he, he made the point. And we said this before, that there are many people who will find everything funny except the thing that affects them, and that he made the point that he is absolutely for transgender issues and it's what he believes in, but he said equal rights means that you can be treated equally when it comes to jokes. Yeah, everybody should have the same jokes made about them. And I'm fine with it because... Here's the thing, like, I I don't believe in treating one special group with kid gloves because, to me, that's more offensive than if you don't include people. I I don't know. I love Ricky. I think he's funny. I love the fact that he makes fun of everybody. Like, he could make fun of me and roast me, and I would absolutely love it. Like, I just, that I think, I think... I have no problem with it. Mm. Can I say one thing? For the most part, people who are negative against these kind of shows or these kind of performances have not watched the entire show. In fact, they probably have not watched one frame of it. Instead, <laughs> they've just seen what people have said on Twitter. They've said it, what, you know, what people have got outraged about and they've gone, well, hang on a minute, I'm angry about that too. They haven't actually watched the whole thing. If you watch, and we played that clip uh, just a moment ago, Rob, thank you for that. They... Uh, where he you're says welcome. it's you're welcome yeah I, I mean i cut it but um uh, <laughs> i don't know i was trying to be a little bit showbiz there um <laughs> the, this is the falling point, apart the point is is that he says it from the moment he goes it's irony obviously there are many f- funny women he's making a joke out of it that's comedy for the most part from what i've seen from people who 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 have commented on twitter they've said things where you clearly have not watched the program because he has said that from the very beginning he has pointed out that it's irony that this is comedy and you know what the biggest thing is and i love this comment if you don't like it, don't watch it. Yes. Okay? No, no one is pulling your eyes open like a, a clockwork orange and making you watch it. I think he's very funny. I get the understanding. And also, I've got to tell you, when he says that thing about taboo when you can you can have 19 topics but the 20th topic makes you upset, I kind of get that. There there are a few things in there where I thought, oh, as a gay man, I'm kind of offended by that. And then I realised, oh, no. I can't be just because that, that that affects me. It's this overall thing. They are jokes. He has said comedy. It's probably shit that you guys say to each other down at the like, you know, the gay Correct. bar anyway. <laughs> Ew, I don't I, I don't know what you're talking about there. That's gross. But but yes, Sarah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Mark, isn't it as simple that if you don't like Ricky Gervais, don't watch it? Why is there now a demand? to get him removed from Netflix. Why isn't it good enough for people just to not like something and not watch it? At at the risk of uh, being called a hypocrite, I'd like to invoke Margaret Thatcher and ask, who are these people? Who are the people (laughs) that are calling for him to be removed from Netflix? Well, it's widely reported. I... 
I don't have their names, ma'am. No, uh, and so who I, are these I people? Wanna, Give me their names uh, and addresses. Show them to me. Introduce <laughs> I'm, me. I'm going by the articles we've read. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, I, I think I think that look, there there will always be outrage over everything. Doesn't doesn't matter what you present. Someone's going to get in in part as as Ricky rightly suggests. Doesn't matter what you suggest. Someone's going to get pissed off about it. Uh, I think that particularly in our present age. There's a lot of lazy journalism that takes place by saying the Twitterati, the yeah. people, yeah, the, someone. The one person on Twitter. It sounds outrageous. I can write a story saying people demand its removal, even though I've got no facts. Mate, Is that what you're saying? You can jump into social media and find someone that will reinforce the angle that you want to push. Yeah, of course. Without it, with, and so all of a sudden you can say social media is up in arms. Yeah. Um, Look, at, when it comes to entertainment, absolutely, you make the choice to watch the thing. If it upsets you, change the channel. Turn it off. Go and watch something else. Um, Hallelujah. I was I was going to uh, lean in and be all offended and say how horrendous the whole special was. Ricky Gervais is a funny bastard. Um, you may not like him. That's fine. I mean, you know, I, in the same breath, I love uh, Amy Poehler. I love um, Tignataro. I love, like, there's a whole bunch of very funny um, uh, comedians that others might find offensive, Dave Anthony, um, that, I mean, you, no one's making anybody listen. No one's making anybody Correct. watch anything. There's no, you know, clockwork or anything like Robo said. I, I do want to encourage, however, that just because people who spend their professional life honing the craft of trying to be funny doesn't mean that your mate Jono or Frankie or Splatface can rock up and say offensive things and go, I'm just joking, eh? I'm just like that Ricky Gervais guy. No, mate, you're not a comedian and you're saying offensive things. I think that's the clear difference. We get to consume and interface with media so directly that anybody thinks that they can do something that someone else does and makes it look easy. And in the process, they're saying really horrendous things and pretending like it's a joke when it's really not. Yeah, fair point. Well, there's a new dawn in breakfast television. Matthew Russell has been named the executive producer of Weekend Today. The extremely talented producer has been in the game for over a decade and brings not only a wealth of knowledge, but a true love for television, which is pretty rare in the industry. I sat down with Matthew, and you can read that exclusive interview on the TV Black Box website. But Aaron, he really is a talented producer... I worked with him early on in his career. He actually worked for me at Nine Promos when we were doing news promos. I love this guy. I really respect him. And I think this is a good move for Weekend Today, which, let's be honest, does need some help. It trails behind <laughs> Sunrise. What? Am I not allowed to say that? No, no, no. I just was laughing at the, the complete understatement of that statement. Oh, okay. <laughs> some work to do. Uh, could do better. <laughs> Well, I find it interesting. I was been thinking about uh, you know today and sunrise and and news breakfast, and I really understand what news breakfast is. So if I'm a news breakfast person, this is what I watch. If I'm a sunrise person, this is what I watch. But today seems to be like they don't know which. Should, should we go the news breakfast way? Should we go the sunrise way? Should we have a funny weatherman? Should we not have a funny? Uh, maybe bring in Shirley Biggs. That'd be great. But. Uh, um, but yeah, I'll be could do worse. <laughs> Ring the bell. Ring the bell now. Matthew Russell, I was lucky to work with at Studio 10, and we used to do this thing where either of us would come, come over to each other and say, Do you want to go and look at television? And we would do that. <laughs> and what we would do, and that would mean that we would walk from the office uh, to the studio and just watch television being made. And I think that's a really special thing about Matthew mm. Russell and, and, and something that I really love about him. The, the best chance that Weekend Today has is having someone who genuinely loves the medium. There are many, many, many people who work in television who don't love it, this who don't a, appreciate this is it. Right here, this yes. moment, David Robinson, yes. you have just hit the nail on the head. Yes. <laughs> Uh, they don't appreciate it, they don't love it, and they don't feel it in their bones. And that is the problem with a lot of television. Um, Matthew Russell is someone who lives it, he breathes it, and he loves it. And that is such a wonderful thing. When we would go and watch television being made, it, it wouldn't have been anything special. It would have been maybe just a, a normal segment that was on Studio 10. But what we loved about it was the lights, the cameras, the, the theatre of it, the the wonder of it. And that is what 
television needs more people like Matthew Russell. I think this is an amazing decision and a wonderful decision by the Nine Network to put him in um, because there are so many people who don't love it. He is a wonderful man. He loves television. And I think this is just absolutely fantastic. And I'm well so said. proud of him. Me too. Absolutely. It, it was an interesting th- – well said, Rob. It was an interesting conversation, Rob, that you and Matthew had. Um, and interesting to note that he's been in television for over a decade. Was he working for you when he was six? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he'll love that. He's he a young, beautiful man. Mm. Very beautiful young man. Uh, the, yeah. the challenge and, – and, and he mentions it in your conversation very diplomatically – is that he is coming off a long run up to fix weekend today? Yeah, like it is, mate. It's third on the weekends um, behind the ABC, and like it is more than daylight. It's a whole other day to catch up with Weekend Sunrise. They're very different programs. The weekday versions of the yes, breakfast shows to the weekend absolutely. ones. Um, so there's some flexibility, and I think even the audience is a little more forgiving if you really want to try some stuff. So. For for what it's worth, my encouragement is try some stuff. Like he will. The only way you're going to get out of that very distant third place is do some really big stuff. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, we've been talking for weeks about the state of free-to-air TV, and now The Australian Today released an article detailing the decline of the once great free-to-air market, most notably in news and breakfast programming. Well, the data from 2012, both Sunrise and Today, were drawing an average weekday viewership of 364,000 and 335,000 in the five cap city metro markets respectively. Flash forward to 2021 and those numbers have dropped to 261,000 for Sunrise and 219,000 for today. Nightly News saw 7 drop 15% in a decade, 9 lose 17% and 10's 5pm news plummet by 49%. While we've seen primetime programming fall across the board, sometimes to 300,000 viewers, it's news that we seem to still hold in high regards in the ratings. But do these declines within 10 years expose that free-to-air TV really is lost in the ocean without a life vest? Well, we can't let an article fly by without giving our two cents. Uh, Mulk, without trying to beat the same dead horse that we've been doing, what is it about news and breakfast TV that's getting people worried about free-to-air this time? Or should we accept that no programming is immune to the decline of free-to-air TV? And the fact is, there is more content available than ever before. Is this just part of the the ship writing itself? Oof. Look, I think yes to all of those things that you said, Rob. Um, the, the the challenge that we face is that it re- it reveals the cracks that maybe before we kind of glossed over in, in like the 10 years ago kind of sense where we might have seen those numbers because I'm sure if they went back another 10 years, there would be a similar kind of differential, maybe not as sharp, but a decline nonetheless. Um, and, and I think that the the, the thing that makes this particularly newsworthy, right? Breakfast television, news television, they're in the same department. And news has long been held as the, the critical notion or the stuff that, that networks build their reputation on, that they are uh, the, the consistent ratings machines, the engine of the, of the networks. And when we see those numbers do that, and see it in that kind of long-term scenario. I mean, if we follow that kind of projection in a linear sense, in 2032, what is news going to be worth anything on free-to-air television? But it doesn't necessarily mean that those figures are going to go down to zero. What it means is there has been a decline as more competition comes into our livelihood. You've got Sky doing breakfast shows. You've got more radio shows. You've got podcasts. There are many different ways to get your news in the morning as you're getting ready. We're We're not seeing news on Stan, Amazon, Netflix, you know, all of the streamers. Yet. Right? News... Well, may, maybe that indeed could be part of its salvation. Um, the, the, the difficulty is that we have to take the acknowledgement that the model, the traditional model that the networks have been holding and clinging to for so, so long is on like the shakiest of ground. And you're, I agree, in, 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 it's not a linear path, right? If anything, it's a little bit on a, a declining exponential situation where it won't go to zero in 10 years. But it will reflect the fact that the audience are getting the stuff that we always used to tune in to six or seven o'clock to get that meat every day 
It's not happening in the sense that it was 10 years ago now. So in 10 years' time, wow. Yeah, look, it's interesting. And look, I did comment on this article. I was quoted in it talking about the impact of social media, Aaron, and how people can catch up on shows, not just, well, not specifically news, but you look at it. In my feed, come 6 o'clock, I get pretty much the biggest stories from the 6 p.m. news straight into my Twitter news feed. So I don't necessarily need to watch the news to know what's going on because if there's something that piques my interest, I can watch it. Yeah. I I, I always, this is just me, I always explain things and analogies. And the, the, the best and the simplest way I think about it is at one time, you know, there's chocolate and strawberry ice cream and they're obviously very popular. And then they, they have 25 flavours. Does that mean chocolate and strawberry ice cream is, is now dead? Well, it's not. It's obviously going to decline because there's 25 other other flavours to choose from. So it just has to evolve and there's going to be, you know, different It'll come and go, but people still still want the chocolate and the strawberry. I think people are just, you know, we can go back like to the 70s and the 80s and stuff, but the reason obviously it's declined more so in, in this, this 10 years is because obviously with the amount of streamers that are out there, I mean, they haven't been around for that long, you know, Prime Video, Apple and all that kind of stuff. People are watching the news, you know, on the train, you know, on Facebook and just consuming their news through that and consuming their news through Twitter and clicking all sorts of stuff and it's just a different way that people are doing it so i think tv still has its place because people will will still want to rely on that it's just that there's a million choices and robo now we have the feed going to digital only it's leaving broadcast television this to me while it's sad because i love broadcast television um, this to me probably seems like the right thing to do. The people who are consuming the feed uh, are not consuming it uh, on SBS at that time slot. They are consuming it uh, via their website, via YouTube, via Facebook, yeah. via Instagram, via TikTok. Yeah. This is pretty smart programming for me. It's sad for people who love broadcast television, but it seems to be the right way to go for people who are broadcast. There is an evolution going on yeah, correct. right yeah, now. Yeah, evolution. Right yep, now yep, as yep. we speak, where yep. it, they are not just relying on linear TV and they're actually yep. now getting off their asses and looking to what an online world looks like. And we can see yep. the resources getting put into the 7 pluses, the 9 nows, those kind of apps and iView sure. and all those kind of things. Look at what 7 did with the Olympic Games and how much choice you had through the 7 plus app. Yep. So the question now comes, does television, linear broadcast television, eventually make the leap, the complete leap to these apps or does it keep uh, a foot in both um, camps? And and we keep talking about declining audiences, but they're reaching audiences in a different way. It's a cost proposition, as you well know, Rob. The challenge, of course, is that if we are trying to deal with a declining audience in the traditional sense of how we used to get all of our monies and less people are watching that, that devalues how much we can sell the slots in a traditional advertising sense for those positions. Now, I agree but absolutely. But I'm being that- told they are making a lot of money from the from the digital side of things. I'm told it's almost, sure. if not equal with broadcast, it's just about equal with broadcast, which sure, I but find digital- phenomenal. Digital isn't holding up seven or nine news at six o'clock at night, right? No. If they are they are making that money, banking that money through advertisers who turn up to the most popular shows on TV every night. Yeah. Um, I agree that the networks, let's just broadly call it television, right? Mm. The television is responding and doing stuff, and it needs to. It needs to. If we think back 20 years ago, when Bolo really first kicked off Sunrise, one of the big hooks was that if you were, was it Optus, I think, or, or whoever it was, if you had a, a mobile phone on Optus, you could watch Sunrise for free yes. on your phone mm. yeah. then. Yeah. 20 years ago, right? It's 2022 now, and we're doing that normally, right? Yeah. That's that's how how television have to take some responsibility and proactively lean into starting to lead the media landscape changes, not be as responsive as they currently are being. It's a hell of a catch-up to, to have to work through. Um, if they want to absolutely retain an authority and an ownership, particularly around news, 
they have to be seen as the leaders because if they're the followers, no one's going to give two shits. Does that mean ratings has no place as we go forward? Well, you would have to ask the people that find value in those ratings, which are the people who sell the advertising slots in that programming. Yeah, look, I'm really having a big think in my own head. It's just something I keep going over, how we determine success in television now, and it may come down to pure revenue. Is this show... How, how much of the budget versus revenue is this show making and, and is that success? You know, in Netflix, yep. you've got a streaming model. But, you know, when, when you for people selling a vacuum cleaner for Dyson, it's about a cost versus profit ratio. Is that what it's yep. going to come down to with television? And that w- we will hear the cries of the creative long in their graves if it gets to that, I think, because all yeah, of a sudden com- then it'll be a financial but, decision. But commercial television is there to make money. That's you how you still determine be if a movie is, is done, because if a movie makes a certain amount at the box office Correct. versus, you know, if it costs $50 million to make but it only makes $20 million, you know, not very good. Yes, with an if, no, with a but. Yes, generally, that's the case. However, we're seeing in the same way, without harking back too much to our conversation earlier, if you are found in favour with the bosses, they will forgive you your flops. Except if it becomes a cost versus profit ratio. because then Which you would have to argue because, that Hollywood because is. Because then you can't... Hi- yeah, but it's Hollywood, not. Mm, but I'm talking Australian television. If we're now down to success being based on profit, those people who skirt by within the industry, failure after failure after failure, but they know the right people, sure. will be caught out. I think if we move to a profit-based regime, if that's entirely the focus, I think that wholesale changes will have to happen in the boardroom for that to be considered. Because while one of the things that, that TV executives like your Sneezebys, like your Warburton's hang the hat on is that they are not just business folk, but they all claim to know and understand and love television. So therefore there's a, 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 a leniency towards the creative and in a, but the right a pure dr- profit driven scenario, there is no room for that. Yes. Yes, there is because the right creative makes money. You can't just program based on what has succeeded in the past. You still need creative flair. You still need a gut instinct to go, you know what, Channel 10, MasterChef, yeah, this show sounds on the surface like it shouldn't work on Australian TV, but we believe in it. We're going to take the punt, and it paid off big time. You I still agree, Rob. need creativity. But if you're running it purely from a we're measuring it by a profit scenario, a cost V return, that's off the table. Uh, No, no, it's not. Because what I'm saying is that you still need to have those creative punts to get the revenue. That's what I'm saying. And and I love you. That's a creative person talking. I think there's going to be a whole heap of other factors because before there might have been a couple of factors, but now there's a lot. So like Holy Moly, for example, they were able to, if they were able to get all of the other... Uh, countries to come in and film in Australia. It, it it was it made sense for Channel Seven to do that, but they weren't able to do that because of COVID. So then the series didn't didn't yeah. continue. I mean, Love Island's a you know a, a big one. Obviously, it doesn't rate very well at all on on broadcast, but it has a huge 150 160 percent uplift. So they can um, access a whole digital market there. Um, whether they can sell the the show overseas, um, whether they're getting money from that. Shows like Big Brother, obviously, all part of yeah, it. do do big big um you know in in other ways and then like for example the celebrity celebrity apprentice probably not so much so they have to look at all of these factors on who they can sell where they can get money from um you know can can it run four times a week and all of these type of factors now not just Mm. you know the advertising dollars yeah Still to come on TV, Black Box, the new boss of 739. The former TV presenter gets a major gig behind the scenes and we'll find out what everyone's been watching when we open the TV Binge Box. Now it's time for Hatches and Dispatches. Following the departure of former head of ABC News, Gavin Morris, Justin Stevens has announced more changes are happening at the National Broadcaster. Matthew Carney will now head up Four Corners, Morag Ramsey will be the boss of Foreign Correspondent, and Joel Toza will lead 7.30. There's no doubt Eden Gahar said Eureka when he found out the news. Oh, God, Robbo. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> 
<laughs> the experienced TV executive has been named the president of Eureka Productions. Mr. Gaha brings a wealth of knowledge to the position, having previously worked on hits such as The Biggest Loser, Master Chef Junior, and Hunted. The company has over 40 titles broadcasting across Australia, Canada, and the United States. He's played a doctor and one of the most famous publicists in the country, but now Roger Gorser is turning his hand to hosting. The Logie-nominated personality has been named the host of Ten's new reality show, The Traders. The enthralling and nail-biting series will see some of Australia's most cunning contestants moving to a grand heritage hotel set amongst a majestic garden estate and work as a team to compete dramatic and challenging missions that will win silver for their prize pot. The Traders is coming soon to 10 and 10 play. If you're sick and tired of seeing big rigs from overseas, never fear. <laughs> Warner Brothers is bringing it home. The studio has confirmed it has commissioned a local series of heavy tow truckers. The show will premiere in Discovery in August. It is really starting to sound like we are promoting some kind of weird fetish television. <laughs> And that is this week's Hatches and Dispatches. Thank you, Sarah. To the ratings race now, Team Red has claimed another weekly network win with 29.8% and Team Blue on 25.4%. The ABC moved into third spot this week on 18% with 10 not far behind on 17.7%. SBS cruised along with 91 on the primary channel shares, it was a two-point lead for seven on 19.9, with nine on 17.9, ABC on 12.3, 10 on 11.1, but an improvement on last week, and SBS had 5.1. 7, 2 and 7, mate, were the clear top two multi-channels, but ABC News moved into third spot thanks to its post-election coverage. Sunrise beat today, and ABC News had a good week, clocking up several wins against today during the week. The semi-final of The Voice rose to over 1.4 million when total. TV ratings are taken into consideration. In overnights, the grand final this past weekend received over 750,000 viewers. Over at nine, Celebrity Apprentice rose a healthy 29% to 697,000 in total TV. Over at nine, Celebrity Apprentice rose a healthy 29% to 697. Now that means it's coming in third compared to MasterChef and Big Brother. So nine might be a little disappointed with those ratings and hope the series builds a little. On Sunday night in overnights, the series is still sitting under 400,000. So it really does need some bigger gains in total TV. Uh, Mulk, any surprises in there for you? Uh, look, the big surprise for me was the Celebrity Apprentice came fourth on Sunday night behind uh, the final of The Voice Australia, which actually rated less than the semi-final, MasterChef, Grand Designs, and then poor old Channel 9 in prime time. Um, this series, of I haven't even looked at an episode of Celebrity Apprentice Australia, I've got to be honest, and I think we talked about this last week. I'm not even going to say on paper it's better. In watching it, it's actually better than last year. Hmm. And and uh, without so what's sort happened? Of like, Is it a promotion thing? Did it not? Get... I think that people just don't like watching Z grade celebrities do shitty things on TV anymore. Hopefully, this is the beginning of the end. Well, of... I was about to say, that's the end of reality TV in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Look, not all of it is celebrity, right? The Bachelor, oh. Um, uh, Survivor, oh. Big Brother, oh. Um, I'm a celebrity, no, it... get me out of here. <laughs> oh. I think it's probably the only one that gets away with it at this point, but even still, it's diminishing, right? Uh, uh, there's... 10 couldn't even pull the A-League Grand Final. They'd be glad that the season's over. They couldn't pull it into the top 20 on Saturday night. Um, almost almost nearly slipped their primary channel down to sixth. Um, so that was a, a horrendous night. Well, yeah, fifth did or sixth I, for them. Did I notice that Antiques Roadshow on the ABC got 197,000 <laughs> yeah. on Sunday night yeah. and was in the top 20, was the number 20 top show? Yeah, correct. Yeah, but it's not It's not on Sunday night. It's so Sunday it's on afternoon. Sunday. Sunday, yeah. But, yeah, no, it slid into the top 20. But that was the nature of television on Sunday, right? And becoming more and more, sport is down. Like, it's all of that kind of weird nastiness. Well, that leads to our previous discussion about what is success now. I'm really keen to see what the, like, the winter quarter is going to deliver us. And I know that for seven, they've got the Com Games coming down the pipe, and that's going to do, I would expect, pretty good business for them. Um, Everybody else really has to lift their game, quite frankly. Um, Because right now, 
uh, as we'll get to in a second when we talk about what we're watching, my eyes are almost, almost exclusively over on non-linear broadcast television. Mm. Aaron, uh, what's your wrap of the week, mate? Yeah, I think with with Celebrity Apprentice, I said last week, you really need to look at the total TV ratings to get an overall picture. So its uplift is is only pushing it into the 600,000 um, in total TV, which, you know, if we're going only by comparison to Big Brother and, and um, uh, MasterChef, that's not great, you know, for Channel 9. So... Which is a shame because I'm really enjoying it. As I said last week, I hated Nine for actually, you know, for the show being so good because I've added an extra three or four hours of TV. I was going to be watching Stranger Things, but I was watching Celebrity Apprentice. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean what's going on with, with TV? I mean, people just like what they like, I suppose. I, it is good that Ten are back in the game a little bit with Have You Been Paying Attention, um, the cheap seats. Five Bedrooms did reasonable, reasonable business considering it's basically an encore screening from Paramount Plus because it's already been screened there if people have, you know, big fans of the show have already watched it there. So... Yeah, I think things are ticking along. It'll be interesting to see how the Commonwealth Games do when that comes up soon. So um, if that's going to bring everyone back to TV. But, um, yeah, it's... that's. I'm not convinced at this point. Yeah. I'm with you, Aaron. I think that that'll be probably the big ticket item in Q3 where the network broadcast TV will have to convince us. Absolutely. And then I think the Commonwealth Games and then the last show really to look at will be the block. If the block is going to go and do... Like this same four hundred, four hundred and fifty thousand. I mean, that that is probably then saying goodbye to overnight figures above six hundred thousand, except for maybe maths. Amazing, amazing that we took the episode of a current affair. I was on rated higher than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the episode, because you were on the episode it. of current affair rates higher than most things. That's the really, yeah. that's the really ironic thing, Sarah. Well, you could just go with it was because of me. I know. <laughs> Sarah, you rated really well because of you. <laughs> Thank you, Monk. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's time to open the TV binge box and bring this sucker home. Robbo, what have you been watching this week? Well, I the only thing I've watched on broadcast television, of course, is anything to do with Sarah Byhan. <laughs> so it's been A Current Affair. It's been Studio 10. I've loved it. And you listened loved to her that. on 4BC, didn't you? I don't know what that is, but I, I'm willing to get on. No, kidding. Love it. Sophie Formica, Afternoons on 4BC. Fantastic. If you want to listen back, 4BC.com, listen. It'll be wonderful. Um, I also watched the uh, the first couple of episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Did you? A little, uh, little uh, trick for you. If you watch uh, in the first episode... Um, one of the visual effects of there's a big wide you know wide shot and one of the um, I don't know like the 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 curtains of where Obi Wan Kenobi is cutting meat it kind of just stops because obviously they didn't render it more and the visual effect just stops and it's and it freezes no. one for you ever yeah watch it it's fun watch it watch it watch I it I did good watch to- it Robbo I'm yep. not sold. See, I didn't watch The Mandalorian and I didn't watch Boba Fett, but I watched this because I knew the story. So I'm pretty much an old man like that. If I don't know something, I can't watch it, but I watched oh, this. Oh, no, Mandalorian's gold. Yeah, Obi-Wan can't watch Kenobi, it. Kenobi, I don't know. It feels like it wants to be a feature film. Mm, well, I really liked it. Mm-hmm. I really liked it. It was going to be a feature film, but when um, Solo, a Star Wars story, didn't go too well, they then relegated this to being just a, a TV series. I uh, really enjoyed just it. Just a also- six-hour TV series <laughs> That's instead right. of a two-hour-and-a-half film. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I also watched uh, Everything or Nothing, which is a fantastic documentary on Stan about James Bond and how uh, that came to be from the book to the screen. Uh, one of the wonderful things that I loved about it was Ian Fleming, who created James Bond, he went up to his wife when he first saw her i think in the caribbean and said i what hope you you're doing? not a no he said i hope you're not a lesbian uh, and that's how he picked her up All that class. was her that was his line i loved it i you know obviously it's not political correct but i thought it was brilliant um and that's what it's I've been a valid question this week. yeah <laughs> Fair is enough. it though really you, you can't ask it anymore but Ian Fleming could. yeah that's right that's what i've been watching all right sarah what have you been watching um well uh, the lights are vivid um, because I'm here as a tourist and then it's amazing outside, like literally watching the Harbour Bridge Vivid right now. It is an amazing It is light show. so good. Um, and then we've been watching a bit of morning TV. So I've been flicking through, you know, whoever's going to have me on that morning. I was about um, to say, just the ones that you're on? <laughs> I've been watching them all, wow. you know. And, wow. um, 
then um, not really much else just because I'm trying not to sit in the hotel room watching TV but just go out mm. and actually enjoy life. Yes, absolutely. Um, Aaron, what have you been watching? Uh, a few things. I just like just to be serious for a moment because um, we're just loving obviously seeing Sarah on, on Studio 10, The Current Affair. But I just, because we know Sarah and, and it's great and we... we Talk, talk about this. We actually forget how brave that Sarah really is. Um, you know, speaking about a person, whoever it is, um, that's sort of being sexually inappropriate um, is a big thing. And how much of an impact that has on the audience and people that are, you know, survivors of sexual abuse or are being sexual abused and are actually speaking out because of because of Sarah. They actually seeing her as a mo- yeah. if she can speak out, then so can I. Um, and we're never going to know all those people because not everyone writes a letter to Sarah and says, oh, I did it because of you. There's going to be hundreds, thousands of people that do that. I mean, similar story. I mean, I, I've done that in my past, um, speaking out um, at, at high schools and, and detention centres. I sort of did a roadshow type thing about my sister and, and her life and about me. And, yeah, it, it, it's good that it has an impact on, on, on people, but you also realise that the person that's delivering it, you know, in this case, Sarah, I mean, it does impact her life as well. Um, has to, you know, bring bring the same subject up over and over again. So I just wanted to yeah. say, Sarah, that we love you. And even though it's great seeing yep. you on TV and we, we talk all about that, it, it is actually a really difficult subject and you're really brave. Um, and you spoke really, really well on A Current Affair in Studio 10. So um, well done. Good on Aaron. you, Sarah. We love Agreed. you. Yep. Yeah. Yes. How do Absolutely. I segue into that to Stranger Things? I'm not sure. <laughs> but, you yeah, know, I, I haven't actually watched Stranger Things. It's, it's come out now, so hopefully I'll give you all a, a review next week. So I've been looking forward to that. I watched the, the, the final ever episode of This Is Us. Channel 10 will have it in a, um, about three or four weeks. Um, really, really good. They ended the show well. Um, Let me guess. There were tears and you were really, really sad. Just like every episode of that show. So the review, the review was that uh, it was really sad and there were lots of tears. Oh, that's what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a lot of shows have been wrapping up. Obviously, in America now, it's the end of their season. So I watched New Amsterdam and um, NCIS Los Angeles, which was actually really good because they, they did a... It's always about crime, but this was a really family-like ending. It was, it was really nice, that, that show. Obviously, Big Brother and, and uh, Celebrity Apprentice. So, oh, And I know we don't talk about... Um, movies that much but i went and saw maverick top gun 2 is the best film ever and i've watched it i've watched Whoa. it twice well maybe not ever Ooh. but it's awesome yeah i've i've heard good things yeah. yeah i look forward to seeing it i heard good things. um i've been watching big brother on seven to no one's surprise hmm. and i'm just loving it it's getting better and better and better so you're the one um i've discovered star trek lower decks on prime video i've seen this show around for a long time and i've never looked at it um, but I've taken a look and I've I've fallen in love with it. It's just so, so good. I watched uh, the season finale of Saturday Night Live on Binge. I do not get why this show is so loved in America. Uh, the, uh, the laughs are few and far in between. The, it the, goes the through skits. seasons. So it's like there'll be like a good year where they have a great cast and then it just sucks for another five years and then they'll have like amazing <laughs> people again and then it just it dies mm. off again. Well, every time I see it, it's just a struggle. The news update segment I love. I always think that does really, really well. But the other things... So it doesn't so totally all suck, Rob? No, it doesn't all suck. Oh, there's thing, I said there are some laughs in it, but the news update segment is probably the, the more laughs per minute segment for mine. Uh, um, I watched Ricky Gervais, Supernature on Netflix and loved it. Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney+. Plus. Eh. And... I've been previewing The Boys, which is on Prime Video. I think it starts this week. This Friday, Triple F premiere. Ah. Oh, my God. Um, And I'm still watching episode three, funnily enough. Um, So I won't be ahead of people in a moment. But uh, I love it. It's back with a vengeance. Where it's going is just great. Love, love, love. Monk, what have you been watching? Yeah, I, I too in preview land have been all over the boys and uh, cannot wait to get the last two episodes now. Um, fortunate to get the first six and uh, for fans of the series, it delivers in spades. 100%. It's so fun, so smart, so dark. Uh, and just when I wondered where they would take it from season two, man, buckle up. Get ready. <laughs> um, other than that, the weekend has been about five words. Stranger Things and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, 
family, Stranger Things is something that gets my family around the television together. So we're enjoying being scared out of our wits watching that program. The Duffer Brothers who made it um, for Netflix said that they wanted to create a, a horror series however knew that when they cast that the story was going to have young small younger people in it that it couldn't be too horrific scary sure but not too horrific but now they've all grown up it can be as scary as we want it to be and holy shit it's scary oh. um there's some really good and really freaky stuff and i'm not a horror fan but i'm deep in stranger things it's it's super good um just a warning for those that are going to try and binge stranger things every episode is over an hour what for the seven episodes we have in this the first part of this final season they're longish and the final one episode seven is an hour and a half the final two episodes drop on the first of july and they are an hour and a half and two and a half hours respectively so wow. that's going to wow. be a solid binge to finish off what has been a, a, a marquee series for Netflix without question. Um, I, I disagree profoundly with you, Rob. I think that Obi-Wan Kenobi is doing some incredible storytelling, brilliant universe building in what must be the hardest job of all when you've got a fixed universe to write a story that melds and weaves into and through that. Um, a big shout out to friend of the show, Steel Saunders, for scoring oh, a yeah. walk-on hey, extra part yeah. in uh, the first episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi and keeping yeah. it secret. Uh, I know just how excited he would have been to get that and then to not say yeah. a word about it was brilliant. So good to see him pop up as Goggles Dude. Um, but, yeah, I'm loving it. I can't wait to see more of it. I think that's doing some good things. Hacks has caught my interest. I was really disappointed with the first couple of eps. The whole first season didn't get me until like episode eight. Um, and I was skeptical when I started Hacks on Stan. Uh, but now I'm really enjoying some of the pattern and the the patter that is happening between the two uh, main characters. I think that's some uh, some good value in it. The, of course, the problem Celebrity with that Apprentice. title, Mulk. Yes. Is that when I said I always assumed it was about computer hackers, but I now know it's about a comedian. <laughs> Very much. <laughs> so it's about hack comedians a lot like that joke, Rob. Um, it wasn't the, a joke. I genuinely, you legitimately I genuine. thought it was about IT guys. Yeah. Wow. Like yeah. the it crowd. God. Um, uh, of course I'm watching Have You Been Paying Attention and The Cheap Seats. And between it and Celebrity Apprentice, there's not a whole bunch else that I'm watching on linear free-to-air television, which is mm. a shame. Mm. Finally, there was a destination point, 9 o'clock Monday to Thursdays, where you could go for news, views, and some variety. Well, it never happened, Rob, because you have to be able to prove that it's going to make money for the network, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this edition of TV Black Box. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Robbo. Don't forget, for more TV exclusives and news you can use, go to tvblackbox.com.au. It's where people in the industry get their news. We'll see you next week. Bye. These are not the McKnights you're looking for. <laughs> 